Hello, and welcome to the Essential Reads podcast, a collection of classic English audiobooks brought to you by me, Isaac. Let's get started. Frankenstein by Mary Shelley, Chapter 6. Clerval then put the following letter into my hands. It was from my own Elizabeth. My dearest cousin, you have been ill, very ill, and even the constant letters of dearest kind Henry are not sufficient to reassure me on your account. You are forbidden to write, to hold a pen, yet one word from you, dear Victor, is necessary to calm our apprehensions. For a long time I have thought that each post would ring this line, and my persuasions have restrained my uncle from undertaking a journey to Ingolstadt. I have prevented his encountering the inconveniences and perhaps dangers of so long a journey, yet how often have I regretted not being able to perform it myself. I figure to myself that the task of attending on your sickbed has devolved on some mercenary old nurse who could never guess your wishes nor minister them with care and affection of your poor cousin. Yet that is now over. Clevel writes that you are indeed getting better. I eagerly hope that you will confirm this intelligence soon in your own handwriting. Get well and return to us. You will find a happy, cheerful home and friends who love you dearly. Your father's health is vigorous and he asks but to see you, but to be assured that you are well and not a care will ever cloud his benevolent countenance. How pleased you would be to remark the improvement of our earnest. He is now sixteen and full of activity and spirit. He is desired to be a true Swiss and enter into the foreign service, but we cannot part with him, at least until his elder brother return to us. My uncle is not pleased with the idea of a military career in a distant country, but Ernest never had your powers of application. He looks upon study as an odious fetter. His time is spent in the open air, climbing the hills or rowing on the lake. I fear that he will become an idler unless we yield the point and permit him to enter on the profession which he has selected. Little alteration, except that the growth of our dear children, has taken place since you left us. The blue lake and snow-clad mountains, they never change, and I think our placid home and our contented hearts are regulated by the same immutable laws. My trifling occupations take up my time and amuse me, and I am rewarded for any exertion by seeing none but happy, kind faces around me. Since you left us, but one change has taken place in our little household. Do you remember on what occasion Justine Moritz entered our family? Probably you do not. I will relate her history, therefore, in a few words. Madame Moritz, her mother, was a widow with four children, of whom Justine was the third. This girl had always been the favourite of her father, but, through a strange perversity, her mother could not endure her, and after the death of Mr. Moritz, treated her very ill. My aunt observed this, and, when Justine was twelve years of age, prevailed on her mother to allow her to live at our house. The republican institutions of our country have produced simpler and happier manners than those which prevail in the great monarchies that surround it. Hence there is little distinction between the several classes of its inhabitants, and the lower orders, being neither so poor nor so despised, their manners are more refined and moral. A servant in Geneva does not mean the same thing as a servant in France and England. Justine thus received in our family learned the duties of a servant, a condition which, in our fortunate country, does not include the idea of ignorance and a sacrifice in the dignity of a human being. Justine, as you may remember, was a great favourite of yours, and I recollect you once remarked that if you were in an ill humour, one glance from Justine could dissipate it, for the same reason that Aristo gives concerning the beauty of Angelica. She looked so frank-hearted and happy. My aunt conceived a great attachment for her, by which she was induced to give her an education superior to that which she had at first intended. This benefit was fully repaid. Justine was the most grateful little creature in the world. I do not mean that she made any professions, I never heard one pass her lips, but you could see by her eyes that she almost adored her protectress. Although her disposition was gay and in many respects inconsiderate, yet she paid the greatest attention to every gesture of my aunt. She thought her the model of all excellence and endeavoured to imitate her phraseology and manners so that even now she often reminds me of her. 
when my dearest aunt died, everyone was too much occupied with their own grief to notice poor Justine, who had attended to her during her illness with the most anxious affection. Poor Justine was very ill. Poor Justine was very ill, but the other trials were reserved for her. One by one, her brothers and sister died. And her mother, with the exception of her neglected daughter, was left childless. The conscience of the woman was troubled. She began to think that the death of her favourites was a judgment from heaven to chastise her partiality. She was a Roman Catholic, and I believe her confessor confirmed the idea of it she had conceived. Accordingly, a few months after your departure for Ingolstadt, Justine was called home by her repentant mother. Poor girl! She wept when she quitted our house. She was much altered since the death of my aunt. Grief had given softness and a winning mildness to her manners, which had before been remarkable for vivacity. Nor was her residence at her mother's house of a nature to restore her gaiety. The poor woman was very vacillating in her repentance. She sometimes begged Justine to forgive her unkindness, but much oftener accused her of having caused the death of her brothers and sisters. Perpetual fretting at length threw Madame Morris into a decline, which at first increased her irritability. But now she is at peace for ever. She died on the first approach of the cold weather, at the beginning of this last winter. Justine has returned to us, and I assure you I love her tenderly. She is very clever and gentle and extremely pretty. As I mentioned before, her mind and her expressions continue to remind me of my dear aunt. I must say also a few words to you, my dear cousin, of little darling William. I wish you could see him. He is very tall for his age, with sweet, laughing blue eyes, dark eyelashes and curling hair. When he smiles, two little dimples appear on each cheek, which are rosy with health. He has already had one or two little vibes, but Louisa Biron is his favourite, a pretty little girl of five years of age. Now, dear Victor, I say you wish to be indulged in a little gossip concerning the good people of Geneva. The pretty Miss Menfield has already received the congratulatory visit on her approaching marriage with a young Englishman, John Melbourne, Esquire. Her ugly sister Manon married Mr. Dullivard, the rich banker last autumn. Your favourite schoolfellow, Louis Manoir, has suffered several misfortunes since the departure of Clairvaux from Geneva, but he has already recovered his spirits, and is reported to be on the point of marrying a very lively, pretty French woman, Madame Traven... Madame Tavernier. She is a widow, and much older than Manoir, but she is very much admired, and a favourite with everybody. I have written myself into better spirits, dear cousin, but my anxiety returns upon me as I conclude. Write, dearest Victor. One line. One word will be a blessing to us. Ten thousand thanks to Henry for his kindness, his affections, and his many letters. We are sincerely grateful. Adieu, my cousin. Take care of yourself, and I entreat you. Write. Elizabeth Lavenza. Geneva, March 18, 17. Dear, dear Elizabeth, I exclaimed when I had read her letter. I will write you immediately and relieve you from the anxiety you must feel. I wrote, and this excursion greatly fatigued me, but my convalescence had commenced and proceeded regularly. In another fortnight, I was able to leave my chamber. One of my first duties on my recovery was to introduce Clairvaux to several professors of the university. In doing this, I underwent a kind of rough usage, ill-befitting the wounds that my mind had sustained. Ever since the fatal night, the end of my labours, the beginning of my misfortunes, I had conceived a violent apathy even to the name of natural philosophy. When I was otherwise quite restored to health, the sight of a chemical instrument would renew all the agony of my nervous symptoms. Henry saw this and had removed all my apparatus from my view. He had also changed my apartment, for he perceived I had acquired a dislike for the room which I had previously made my laboratory. But these cares of Clairvaux were made of no avail when I visited my professors. Mr. Voltman inflicted torture when he praised, with kindness and warmth, the astonishing progress I had made in the sciences. He soon perceived that I disliked the subject, but, not guessing the real cause, he attributed my feelings to modesty, and changed the subject from my approvement to the science itself, with a desire, as I evidently saw, of drawing me out. What could I do? 
He meant to please. He tormented me. I felt as if he had placed carefully, one by one, in my view, those instruments which were to be afterwards used in putting me to a slow and cruel death. I withered under his words, yet dared not exhibit the pain I felt. Clerval, whose eyes and feelings were always quick in discerning the sensations of others, declined the subject, alleging in excuse his total ignorance, and the conversation took a more general turn. I thanked my friend from my heart, but... I did not speak. I saw plainly that he was surprised, but he never attempted to draw my secret from me. And although I loved him with a mixture of affection and reverence that knew no bounds, yet I could never persuade myself to confide to him that event which was so often present to my recollections, but which I feared the detail to another would only impress more deeply. Mr. Kremper was not easily docile, and in my condition at the time, of almost insupportable sensitiveness, his harsh, blunt encomiums gave me even more pain than the benevolent approbations of Mr. Waldman. "'Damn the fellow!' cried he. "'By Mr. Clerval, I assure you he has outstripped all of us. Aye, stare if you please, but he is nevertheless true. A youngster who, but a few years ago, believed in Cornelius Agrippa as firmly as the gospel, has now set himself at the head of the university, and if he is not soon pulled down, we shall all be out of countenance. Aye, aye continued he, observing my face expressive of suffering. Mr. Frankenstein is modest, an excellent quality in a young man. Young men should be diffident of themselves, you know, Mr. Clerval. I was myself when young, but that bears you out in a very short time. Mr. Kremper had now commenced a eulogy on himself, which happily turned the conversation from a subject that was so annoying to me. Clerval had never sympathized in my taste for natural science, and his literary pursuits different wholly from those which had occupied me. He came to the university with the design of making himself complete master of oriental languages, and thus he should open a field for the plan of life he marked out for himself. Resolved to pursue no inglorious career, he turned his eyes towards the east as affording scope for his spirits of enterprise. The Persian, Arabic, and Sanskrit languages engaged his attention, and I was easily induced to enter on the same studies. Idleness had ever been irksome to me, and now that I wished to fly from reflection and hated my former studies, I felt a great relief in being the fellow pupil with my friend, and found not only instruction, but consolation in the works of the Orientalists. I did not, like him, attempt a critical knowledge of their dialects, for I did not contemplate making any other use of them other than temporary amusement. I read merely to understand their meaning, and they well repaid my labours. Their melancholy is soothing, and their joy elevating, to a degree I had never experienced in studying the authors of any other country. When you read their writings, life appears to consist in a warm sun and a garden of roses, in the smiles and frowns of a fair enemy, and in the fire that consumes your own heart. How different from the manly and heroic poetry of Greece and Rome! Summer passed away in these occupations, and my return to Geneva was fixed for the latter end of autumn, but, being delayed by several accidents, winter and snow arrived. The snows were deemed impassable, and my journey was retarded until the ensuing spring. I felt this delay very bitterly, for I longed to see my native town and my beloved friends. My return had only been delayed so long from an unwillingness to leave Clerval in a strange place before he'd become acquainted with any of its inhabitants. The winter, however, was spent cheerfully, and, although the spring was uncommonly late, and when it came, its beauty compensated for its dilatoriness. The month of May had already commenced, and I expected the letter daily which was to fix the date of my departure when Henry proposed a pedestrian tour of the environs of Ingolstadt that I might bid a farewell to the country I had so long inhabited. I acceded with pleasure to this proposition. I was fond of exercise, and Clerval had always been my favourite companion in the rambles of this nature that I had taken among the scenes of my native country. We passed a fortnight in these preambulations. My health and spirits had long been restored, and they gained additional strength from the salubrious air I breathed, the natural incidents of our progression, and the conversation of my friend. Study had before secluded me from the intercourse of my fellow creatures and rendered me unsocial, but Clerval called forth the better feelings of my heart, 
He again taught me to love the aspects of nature and the cheerful faces of children. Excellent friend, how sincerely did you love me and endeavour to elevate my mind until it was on a level with your own? A selfish pursuit had cramped and narrowed me until your gentleness and affection warmed and opened my senses. I became the same happy creature who a few years ago, loved and beloved by all, had no sorrow or care. When happy, inanimate nature had all the powers of bestowing on me the most delightful sensations. A serene sky and verdant fields filled me with ecstasy. The present season was indeed divine. The flowers of spring bloomed in the hedges, while those of summer were already in bud. I was undisturbed by thoughts which during the preceding year had pressed upon me, notwithstanding my endeavours to throw them off, with an invincible burden. Henry rejoiced in my gaiety and sincerely sympathised with my feelings. He exerted himself to amuse me, while he expressed the sensations that filled his soul. The resources of his mind, on this occasion, were truly astonishing. His conversation was full of imagination, and very often, in imitation of the Persian and Arabic writers, he invented tales of wonderful fancy and passion. In other times, he repeated my favourite poems, or drew me out into arguments which he supported with great ingenuity. We returned to our college on a Sunday afternoon. The peasants were dancing, and everyone we met appeared gay and happy. My own spirits were high, and I bounded along with feelings of unbridled joy and hilarity. Thank you so very much for listening. If you enjoyed, please leave a review. If you're on YouTube, subscribe, comment, like, all the youtube things. And if you really want to support me, go to my Patreon. The link is in the description box. Once again, thank you very, very much for listening. And until next time, bye-bye.